Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Today, Be Cool invited Jim Cockrum, a well-known e-commerce titan, an expert who's been helping other Amazon sellers for many years. He's been building his businesses for over two decades, to be exact, since 2002. And we have the honor to talk to Jim again and hear a lot of new advice for him. Let's welcome Jim to our channel today. Wow, thank you, man. That's an awesome uh, introduction. I haven't been called a titan that many times. Uh, two, two decades sounds really old in e-commerce years, man. But yeah, <laughs> only income for my family for 20 years now, man. I can't believe it. Quick 20 years, but great to be here, Samuel. Good to see you, my friend. That's amazing. Like for 20 years, like you're one of the OGs in the industry, right? Like, Apparently, man. I'm, yeah, that's what I keep hearing. <laughs> so I want to ask you, just to, you know, for the audience who don't know you, most people do know you, but for the ones who don't, you know, who is Jim Cockrum and why are you known as Silent Jim? You know, it's a good domain name. It's good to have one of those really short, hard to spell, easy, hard to misspell domain names. It's Silent Jim, right? Like that that works. But uh, yeah, my best selling book that I've written, I've written a handful, but Silent Sales Machine is the name of the book, Treating the Internet Like a Multiple Stream of Income Generating Machine, Silent sales machine that book did so well it's old i'm in version 11 at this point oh wow uh, it's about to be released at silent sales little plug for a for an inexpensive ebook but uh, so silent jim kind of stuck and there's a lot of other significance in that word for me we don't have to dive into it but yeah i'm a i'm a husband uh we got married in 1994 we've got five kids Three of them are married now, so my kids are getting a little older just had a wedding recently for our third kiddo congratulations uh, Thank you so much, man. And just blessed. Three sons married to three wonderful ladies who love God, great families. Man, we're just so blessed. And then we've got uh, two still at home, but they're all either involved in their own entrepreneurial businesses involving e-commerce or other businesses or involved with my business. Very close family, homeschooled for all of them all the way up. And it's just been a blessed life. Like I said, using e-commerce and multiple streams of income to provide for our family for, like we mentioned, a couple decades and that's the short version of the story. Hey, I love to know uh, the longer version. And I know uh, for the Proven Conference, Andrew, your wife, is going to be sharing, you know, how do you be a spouse to an entrepreneur for 20 years, right? And yeah. how do you, you know, have five kids and <laughs> everything like that? Yeah, so that's yeah. so interesting. We had all these theories why I was silent, Jim, and you've dispelled them. Yeah, so uh, now we know why you're called Silent Jim. But I want to ask you, how did you get involved in e-commerce? I sold a pair of, if you've never heard this story before, Samuel, I think you might appreciate this story. Uh, I mean, maybe you have heard it before. But uh, the first thing I sold on eBay of any significance was a pair of old Nike Air Jordans. Oh, those are expensive. About $20 at the time because they were on sale at a store near me and they had a whole wall of them. The equivalent of a probably a few million dollars worth of Nike Air Jordans, but they were worthless shoes at the time. True basketball players didn't really like them. They were bad shoes, but I had a pair that I'd held on to for about a decade or so. And I started noticing the price was going up on them. And I put them on eBay, sold them to a guy in Singapore for somewhere between $750, $800, something like that. After paying 20 bucks, I was hooked on e-commerce, started just consuming all my spare time, weekends, evenings, playing around online on eBay, launching websites and started sharing my story and that story resonated with people and how they could kind of do some of the stuff that I was up to. And that turned into a community of people at this point, a 73,000 member Facebook group at silentgym.com. There's a link if you want to check it out. A podcast that just passed 5 million downloads and 600 plus episodes and an Amazon training course that's doing really well, serving a lot of people. We've coached 10,000 people at this point with oh, our wow. coaching program. You know, that's the 20 year journey. And I honestly feel like we've just gotten started. Like the first 20 years was laying the foundation for the really good stuff. So we're super excited about the future. And uh, that's my journey through e-commerce. Again, the, the short, dirty version. I think we're in a very good industry because the growth rate for this industry is like 20, 30%. And even after slowing down, it's still around 13%. But what mm -hmm. I want to know, Jim, is a lot of people, you know, they do well themselves in the e-commerce business but they don't really help other people. They're very happy just to help themselves and you know mm -hmm. people they know. How did you decide to start to help others to build their online business like what you're doing now? I've been saying the same thing for 20 years. I want to surround myself with other people of integrity who are looking to use the internet creatively to launch and grow multiple streams of income. I, I noticed very early on that the beauty of the internet 
when it came to business, you know, you go back to the nineties, it was, a, this was a new thing. This was a new phenomenon. So many people in their twenties, maybe even thirties, they've kind of grown up with it, but I'm in my mid fifties. Now the internet was new and the rule that it changed, the rules of business have never changed. They never will change. You got to provide value, right? If you, you got to make a profit, if you want to continue to provide that value and serve your customers, those rules will never change. What did change was how easy it became to test new ideas and launch new concepts. You could fail all day, every day and barely lose any money. And if only one of 15 ideas worked out, run with that one and keep testing more ideas. So you're building multiple streams of income, always be testing, always be trying new things. And that's what got me hooked, that concept. And I wanted to surround myself with other people who understood how incredible it was the time that we live in where the rules of how to launch a business and the risk associated with launching a business had dramatically changed forever, right underneath our noses. And some people still don't realize how big of a deal that is. If you tried to launch a business in the 70s and 80s, it meant raising a ton of capital, putting at risk for several years and about a 75 to 90% chance it was going to turn to dust within five years. That's what launching a business meant. Now, $5 here, $20 there, test an ad there, test a concept here, launch a product, try to sell a few units, sell a pair of shoes to a guy in Singapore as an American. Right. You, I mean, there's so many opportunities right under our noses. So that's what got me into e-commerce. That's what got me hooked. And why share it with other people? Well, because I wanted to be a part of a community of people who understood I could bounce ideas off of and I could test new concepts with and partner with and try new things. I wanted that community. I didn't want to be a lonely guy with his keyboard and his monitor trying, you know, to build a business. I wanted to do it with a community. So I shared my journey openly and I encourage other people in our team to do so to this day. We have an abundance mindset. We have a transparency in our community. Here's what I'm working on. Here's what's working. Here's what isn't working. So it's the community. That's why I, that's why I shared it. I don't doing it alone is almost a guarantee that you're going to burn out and fail at some point. Yeah. I really like what you said about having the community in place. Uh, there's a book I've been reading. It's about, you know, having a tribe. So you surround yourself with like-minded people with the similar goals, and it's much easier. It's like, if you want to go work out, you know, make friends with people who work out, go to the gym, you know, just being exactly. there and being mm -hmm. there, you're going to get ideas and things like that. Now, what I want to ask you is, you know, how did you transfer from, you know, eBay or other e-commerce? And then you learn about the business on Amazon. How did that happen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The transfer from eBay to, eBay to Amazon kind of happened because Amazon snuck up on all of us there for a long time. It looked like eBay was going to dominate the universe and, and kind of like Blockbuster lost to Netflix, eBay lost to Amazon. Blockbuster video could still be internationally known and they could have Netflixed themselves, but they chose not to. eBay could have opened up warehouses and said, Hey sellers, send us your inventory. We'll ship it for you. You don't have to store it in your garage anymore. That's basically what Amazon did said, Hey, we're going to be the everything store. And we're going to store the stuff here. So the convenience being able to get the business out of your house, stock your inventory there as stuff sells, it ships using the most incredible low shipping rates the world's ever seen, creating incredible convenience, delivering stuff within a couple hours in most major metropolitan areas. It was an incredible opportunity to jump in and help Amazon fill their shelf space. So those of us who had been playing around on eBay and kind of looking for profitable products, suddenly this whole new paradigm shift of the opportunity came into play where your only limit now is your ability to get your hands on some capital. If you're good at finding inventory, the only limit you have is getting your hands on some capital. And I was in a community of people, we were really good at finding inventory. So, hey, let's go to where the all the eyeballs are. Half the transactions in the United States almost every day are on Amazon, eBay, Walmart, all those Shopify sites and all the other billion places you can go to buy stuff. They're the other half of the transactions. Amazon's half the action. So that's why we're there. That's where all the eyeballs are. It's not that I particularly love Amazon as a company. It's that's where the biggest opportunities are right now by far and growing. So that's why we focus and kind of pivoted away. We still sell on eBay. I sold in the past 90 days, I've sold $65,000 or so on eBay, but that's just a tiny piece of my business. Amazon is far bigger, a far bigger piece, far bigger focus, time, effort, energy spent there. When do you sell on eBay and when do you sell on Amazon? Yeah, the, the simplest way to say that is if it's a if it's a one-off item, right? You're not sure what the value is. Someone's going to find it valuable, but I'm not sure if it's worth 50 bucks or if it's worth 380. I have no idea. Let's just put it out there $250 and see if anyone bites or makes an offer. Maybe it's chipped, dented, scratched. I don't have a receipt. We picked up a yard sale. It's something that fell off a shelf in the warehouse and now it's worth half maybe what it would have been. We're not going to send that into Amazon and get a customer complaint. 
take some good pictures, throw it on eBay. If you're selling physical products, you're going to have what many of us call a death pile, which is like, what are we gonna do with all that stuff over there? I don't know what to do with that stuff. Put it on eBay, put it on Facebook marketplace, move it, try to turn it into cash. Sometime between now and six months from now, when we decide just to go donate it to, you know, some local charity or food pantry or something. Amazon's for the nice, clean repeat sale stuff. We're going to sell a handful of units at a minimum per month over and over kind of like the rinse and repeat model is Amazon, the one at a time, strange, weird. What do we do with this stuff? That's eBay. Yeah. I like what you mentioned, like how you differentiate the different type of products and also mentioning Facebook marketplace with there's no fees. Yeah. But of course yeah. uh, you have to deliver that item. So it's like, yeah. kind of like doing FBM versus FBA a little bit as well. Now I want to yeah. ask you what kind of products, let's say for Amazon, do you recommend people to use FBM and which one do you recommend to use FBA? Uh, you know, it's a, it's such a case by case thing. I say do both unless you have a good reason not to, as a general rule. On any given ASIN, if you're doing some FBA and you've got the warehouse space, do some merchant fulfill as well. Do some FBM as well. You can sell, some sellers don't realize, you can sell FBA at one price on the same ASIN and sell FBM at a different price on the same ASIN. So get in there, try it, experiment. Uh, we've got a po recent podcast episode on our channel where I interviewed a guy. He is all FBM. He's shipping it himself and he's taking advantage of, for example, there's a lot of national sales that will happen across the entire United States all at the same time. So let's say Kroger puts a certain product on sale and the sale starts Monday. Well, by Monday afternoon, he's bought a bunch of that and he's listed it merchant fulfill. So he's taking orders the day it goes on sale. You with me? The people who are selling at FBA, they've got to wait to pack it, to prep it, to ship it, Amazon receives it. They put it on a shelf somewhere and wait a week for who knows what reason. And they pull it down again and they check it in, right? It's like two, three weeks later, that stuff's for sale along with everyone else who hit that same sale and jumped on that FBA item. So it goes from five sellers to 30 sellers suddenly about three weeks after the sale happens, right? Well, if you're merchant fulfilling, you can sell it right now today. So by the time everyone else gets their inventory to FBA, he's already sold a ton of product merchant fulfill. So if you want to get it available quickly, you'll hear stories around Christmas time, fourth quarter of the year, people will be in stores hitting the sales and the deals, you know, the 80% off sale just in time for Christmas stuff. And in the shopping cart in line to pay for their retail arbitrage fines, they're listing it on Amazon and it's selling before they pay for it at the register. It's sold. They've reeled out the parking. They're wheeling their sold inventory out to their car <laughs> to go home and ship it because they merchant fulfilled. So when time is of the essence, merchant fulfill can make a lot of sense. Uh, it, it can take three to six weeks to check inventory in at Amazon, especially around Christmas time. So Merchant Fulfill becomes a great idea then. But I'm saying do both. Why not? If it's profitable, the answer is yes, do it. I think too many times we put ourselves into, should I do this or should I do that? Always use the word and unless you're forced to use the word or. Should I do this and that? Yeah, go for it. They both make sense until there's a reason to do just one or the other. Do both. So I think the advice... Uh, Jim is saying that, you know, you could do FBM and FBA at the same time. And for FBM, generally, it's a lot faster. You can ship it yourself. And if you're shipping using FBM, make sure to ship within two days. Yeah. So you'll have a good score. And this would or help even a you. better tip. Do the one day. Somebody like, oh, that's a big commitment. <laughs> That gives you a huge advantage in the buy box, yes. that little 25% shift of an advantage to saying, hey, we're willing to ship within a day. Like, oh, I don't want to ship stuff on Saturday. Hire somebody to ship stuff on Saturday. It's worth it because you're going to win the buy box so more often. And you don't have to ship on Sundays, but you do have to ship on Saturdays. But do the one day. Try it out. You will see a big increase in your merchant fulfill sales. I'm curious now about outsourcing, about growing your business. Sure. So when you start outsourcing, when should you start outsourcing your Amazon business? Yeah, bringing other people in to help. You know, at the at the point where you've got a viable, profitable business, and I've, I've seen, you know, I've been at this for 20 years, Samuel. So I've seen people do it themselves. It's just me, it's my spouse, and we're just going to work this as our little 15, 20 an hour thing. And we're going to grow it as big as we can, just the two of us. We don't want to mess with other people. And that puts a cap. Growing a business means growing a team. It means being a leader. So you need to add other people to your business and the best first person to add to your business. And this is a biblical concept, actually. I've studied this a lot. I've got this question a lot over the years. The first person, well, let me start with the wrong person to add. A lot of people add a convenience hire. They want someone to do the parts of the business that they just don't like doing, the stuff that's inconvenient, the stuff I just can't get to because I don't like doing it. It's not in my skill set or you know, I don't like wearing that hat. So I'm going to hire someone else to wear that hat. 
that's a huge mistake. As a young business, your first hire must be someone who brings more revenue to the business. If you're in if a business that sale, sells things, you want to be a salesperson as your first hire, not a convenience hire, not a secretary. You want a sales rep. So when you're selling online, that is someone else who finds profitable inventory. If you're selling physical products, you want someone else who's finding profitable inventory. In our community, we start new sellers off with the replens model. The first person you hire is a virtual assistant, probably from the Philippines for three, four, five dollars an hour, hunting for great replen ASINs that you can sell against. So you've got someone else out there finding revenue and dragging it back to the business. That's their first hire. So the first hire from your recommendation, from Jim's recommendation, is to find someone that can help you grow your business. And that's really different from what I've heard from a lot of sellers. But it totally makes sense because now your business is bigger you're getting more revenue, then later on, you can find other people you know, to do some of those other tasks mm -hmm. while you continue to grow your business. Now, Jim, yeah. what if I'm the person who's sourcing? Like, what if mm -hmm. what I'm, I'm the main person sourcing, but I'm spending all this time prepping and packing my products? What is your recommendation? Like, some people might say, like, well, I, I could spend more time sourcing if I move some of those tasks. For like preparing. If I free up my time. Yeah, yeah free up no, my time, exactly. That's if it's argument. one of your kids, a neighborhood kid, a few dollars an hour, you know, this isn't a hard, fast rule, but I don't like to see growing businesses get stuck in the habit of paying somebody to do stuff because they just kind of don't like doing it. They're just trying to free up a little bit of their time. Mm -hmm. You will go so much further, so much faster if you bring in other revenue producing assets such as people who are hunting. And so there's a reason why starting any business has a period of intense focused effort. It's out of balance. It's uncomfortable. It's not sustainable. It's difficult. It's hard on you, hard on your family, hard on your relationships, hard on there. Doing business, the launch phase is hard. When a rocket takes off, you know, from the launch pad, like 90% of the fuel is burned in those first, you know, 15, 12, 15 seconds. You know, it's got to three week journey. Most of the fuel has gone just getting it off the launch pad. That's a period of intense focused effort. So yeah, it's going to be uncomfortable. Yeah. You probably could spend a little more time looking for winning ASINs if you weren't putting tape on boxes, but stick with it, stick through that period of it's somewhere between a couple months to six, eight months, something like that, where it's uncomfortable. But that first person you hire, trust me, you'll be so much better off a year, two years in. If you find someone else that you can say, Hey, here's how we find profitable inventory. You need to start helping me do this. That extra revenue that's coming in, you use that extra revenue, those net margins to hire someone to put tape on boxes, to hire somebody to prep and pack for you. Now you get your prep center, someone else's touching the box tape and sweeping the floors and checking the mail. And suddenly you step back and you're just checking your numbers because you've got a team, but you will get to that point so much faster. If your first hires are revenue producing assets. That's really useful tip. Thank you, Jim, for sharing that. Now I want to ask you, how do you effectively manage the people who you hire or who work for you? You know, we live in, I'm actually writing a book on this topic. I'll give you the, I'll give you the title. Hopefully no one steals it. <laughs> I've given it publicly a few times. It's called Leading with Depth in the Shallow Waters of Social Media. You're going to have a lot of virtual relationships as a business leader. And make no mistake, being a business owner is being a business leader. You can't get away from leadership responsibilities if you own a business. Your business depends on you becoming an ever better leader. Leadership means relationships. We're talking about virtual relationships, with, which means you don't want to rely on just email and text. You want to get on Zooms. You want to meet face-to-face, -face, if at all possible, at least occasionally. You want to learn about their family. You want to learn about their interests. You've got to show empathy when they're going through a hard time. And you can't do this with 50 people. I've got a team of 100 people that I work with. My core leaders are the ones that I have the highest level of relational intimacy, right? My coaching directors and the coaching team directors and the, the head of our support team has been with me for you know, 15 plus years. You know, those are the people that I kind of keep close tabs on and they keep tabs on. It's an infrastructure, but you've got to, even though we're very virtual organizations, you've got to have a kind of an understood infrastructure. Who's in charge of who? Who's in charge of checking in on who? Who's in charge of making sure that you know, this person in your organization is actually doing their job. Who do they report to? Almost like even if it's an unofficial org chart. And I know many operations go by the rule, 
businesses say you, you can't have more than five people report to you. So if you've got like 15 people that report directly to you, that's not sustainable or manageable. You need to put someone in place. You need to delegate someone who can maintain those quality relationships. As humans, we're not capable of maintaining a tight quality relationship with more than a handful of people. Most people are shocked to hear this, but a study of human nature, Samuel, I don't know if you've ever heard this or before or not, but we are emotionally incapable of truly caring deeply about more than about eight to 10 people. That's the max where you can be truly emotionally attached to the point where their death would devastate you. We're not capable of having more people than that. I'm just a little shit shocked, but I think it is, there's a lot of truth in that. Yeah. I'm, I'm so thinking it, about the people and I, I've now I'm thinking, you know, the names are coming up and pictures are coming up, but yeah. I think you're right. And you have to operate your business the same kind of way, like to, to maintain that level of intimacy where you truly love back and forth and you truly keep tabs on each other. You can't do that with 50 people. You just can't. You're not capable of it. You got your spouse, you got your kids, you got your immediate family, you got a few people at work that you can do that with. And that's about it. And then you got to build structure, infrastructure. And so that, that coaching manager on my team is in charge of building those kind of relationships with the coaching students so those, with the coaches and the coaching students. Now those people can contact me, but I'm not going to have that same level of intimate relationship. It can't possibly be expected of me. So those are the kind of things when you talk about managing your group, who are those three to five, maybe eight people at the most that you really kind of pour into, you know, Jesus poured into 12. That's it. He capped it at 12. Jesus didn't have 80 disciples. He had 12, <laughs> right? Like, yeah. yeah 12 so the son of God can only manage intimate relationships with 12 and change the world by the way, doing it. Who are we to think that we can do that with a larger group of people? Right. Moses was also 12 as well, right? As you yeah, mentioned. The, the tribes yeah. of Israel, 12. It's a significant number. Yeah. If you find yourself having more than eight, 10, 12 people kind of reporting directly to you, like uh, it, you need some more infrastructure in there. How do you keep like your coaching director, all these different people, you know, you worked with them for 10, 15 years. How do you continue? How do you keep them happy? And I wouldn't say happy, but you know, working together for such a long time. How you do you know, keep them on your staff? One of the rules that I've had and anyone I've had a relationship with in e-commerce and partnered with on a project is, and I tell them this early on, I've, I've literally told 150 people this over the years. That's this. We're getting ready to work on a project together. If at any point in time, it feels like this is a 50-50 arrangement or that heaven help us, I'm coming out ahead of you in this arrangement, something's broke because the deal I want to make with you right now is you're the winner. If this tips in anyone's favor, it's tipping in your favor. I'm here to make your life better. I'm here to serve you. I'm here to make sure that you feel like I'm getting a little overpaid here. I want you feeling like you're being overpaid working with me, that the benefits far outweigh the sacrifices and commitment that you've made. And if we can't have that, this isn't the right place for you. And we'll part ways as friends. So as, so, as long as I'm able to deliver that as a, as a leader and effective partner in those kind of relationships where it's just so much in their advantage, people tend to stick around because they feel loved and trusted and respected and rewarded for being associated with you. And suddenly you find yourself surrounded by a bunch of people who not only appreciate you as a friend, but have benefited financially significantly from that association. That's a pretty loyal crowd. So this team of a hundred people, many of whom I'll only speak to a few times a year, maybe, but they're working hard, at least a part of their week on what we're building together as a team. Let's bring back to Amazon business because we talked about sure. management and you know how the infrastructure, caring about your team members. Which business model do you prefer among retail arbitrage, online arbitrage, wholesale, and private label, and why? Absolutely. Well, we've kind of got a pyramid structure that we've learned to introduce to the new sellers in our community. And one of the reasons why we have hundreds of success stories on our podcast of recent success stories of people who've come through our program, 10,000 coaching students. We've got about 1,700 tagged success stories in our free Facebook group. Little plug, it's free. Silentgym.com has a link to our free Facebook group. The reason that's all true is because we start people with what we call the replens model. And that is just simply finding the underserved shelf space at Amazon. It's a low risk, low barrier to entry, low learning curve, very inexpensive business model to learn. And you're putting money in the bank while you learn the basics. It's, it's a hybrid of retail and online arbitrage model, but it's not scanning barcodes and looking for sales and discounts and closeouts. That's not it. We call out the Easter egg hunt or even a treadmill model. Like you're always trying to churn, looking for more inventory. That's not what we're talking about. Replens is finding those underserved listings on Amazon that you can hop in alongside two, three, five, 10, 15 other sellers at times and find a little wiggle room in there where you're selling a good 
two, three, five, 10, 15 units a month against that ASIN. You find yourself a book of business of about a hundred of those ASINs. You've got a viable twenty, thirty thousand dollars a month, high profit business running somewhere around 20 to 25% net profit margin on average, maybe 80 to hundred percent ROI. Your inventory is turning quickly. That's the foundational model. Then you move into some of those other wholesale, private label, print on demand, opportunities, those sorts of things. We teach all of that, but we don't start our new students there. Is it hard to find these replants? Because I'm playing just from another angle is let's say like you're a seller and I'll go look through your seller account and then I could do reverse sourcing and I can find Absolutely. all those products that you are selling. And then, mm -hmm. then I'm going to go and jump on those listings. So That's the one of the strategies we teach. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Right. <laughs> let's say it's a product that sells 2000 times a month. There's plenty of those products on Amazon. And let's say that only maybe 40% of the sellers are making a profit. The other sellers are playing in the mud, low prices. I might send in a handful of units at a very nice high price, mind you, knowing that there's going to be a regional advantage based on the warehouse that my inventory lands in. Don't think of Amazon as one store that we're all shopping at. Amazon is a bunch of warehouses all over the United States. So let's take a you know, a single mom with a busy schedule. It's Saturday morning, 10 a.m. She's got a birthday party in six hours for her daughter. And she needs the Playhouse Barbie with the green hat. And she doesn't have time to go to Walmart. She needs two-hour prime now delivery. Well, you just so happen to be sitting on one of those. And it's sitting in a warehouse just down the street from her. She doesn't care that you're the lowest price, right? There's 60 she sellers. She wants it immediately. She wants it now. Now. Yeah. So she's going to grab it. And you're in the buy box. You're the only one in the buy box because she's saying, I need prime now. Do you follow? So you don't have to be the low price. You don't have to compete for the buy box. If you're talking about a fast moving piece of inventory. So suddenly it opens up the fact that even if I'm sitting on an ASIN with a whole bunch of other sellers, that doesn't mean I have to be the lowest price seller to win some of the action. So those little lessons that start to become evident over time as a seller. Yeah. Anybody can look through anyone's catalog anytime you want to. A lot of my ASINs, if someone were to see my catalog, it's stuff I'm trying to get rid of. So yeah, have fun. Jump on those ASINs. <laughs> you know, you're not going to make any money, neither of the rest of us right now. Come back a few months from now, it might be hot enough that we are making some money on it. I've, I've got other ASINs where I've got a little price advantage. I've actually buy these things locally. I know the manufacturer, so I've got a deal there. Right. So just because you can see my catalog doesn't mean you can duplicate my results. It doesn't mean you know which of my ASINs are my really hot sellers and which ones are I'm kind of dogs I'm trying to get rid of. So yeah, it's public information, but those underserved ASINs, those underserved listings are everywhere. You can even, you can even look through Amazon and find right now, as we're talking, Samuel, there's probably, I don't know, millions at least of listings that have gone dry. Nobody's selling the product anymore. Amazon's not on it and there's no sellers on it. Up until six months ago, it was hot. The manufacturer ran out for three months. Nobody could get it. It sold out on Amazon. Now it's back in stock and stores everywhere, but nobody's gone out and grabbed it and filled the shelves again. If you learn how to recognize those opportunities, right? That's an underserved ASIN. So there's all kinds of examples of underserved ASINs. And again, the evidence is, and this is the reason our podcast has this format. We've interviewed hundreds of people who are doing this successfully. In the vast majority of cases, they've never made any money in any kind of business, let alone e-commerce before. So it's a very viable business model. I've heard all the excuses. I've heard all the reasons why it shouldn't work. And I continue to have a parade of people who are building beautiful businesses, changing their lives. And again, this is just the base level foundational Amazon model that we're talking about. Once you've got this one going, about $10,000 of sales per month is kind of that baseline we like to see. The sky's the limit. You can branch off into so many other, you know, branded bundles and print on demand and private label and wholesale and just all kinds of opportunities. Even get into consulting, other businesses, helping brands get established. There's opportunities in so many directions, but that, that's the foundational model. And we've got plenty of seven figure sellers in our community that are doing just that. You know, maybe with their spouse, a couple of kids working for them, working hard, putting three to $500,000 in the bank every year, part-time, full-time. It's a, it's a beautiful model, man. And it's continuing to expand. The future is extremely bright for that model. Yeah. I think a lot of people, they might think is overly competitive, but like what Jim mentioned, there's a lot of underserved ASINs. And also one of the things that people, you know, don't think about is that there's actually more and more prime members prime Amazon members. So more and more people in the United States and other countries, they're reliant now on buying online, especially after the COVID. So they're now more used to it. 
And then so now, you know, they might place an order. And I have to comment on this because, you know, we're the experts in buy box. I mean, like you mentioned, when you're shipping a product, you might ship to different warehouses. So the person who owns the buy box will be different from different location to location. Mm -hmm. So if you have a regional advantage, you could get the buy box at a higher price. And That's somebody right. might need that specific thing right away, or there might not be a store that sells that around them. So, you know, yep. definitely what Jim said. Now, I wanted to ask you, my understanding is there is the Proven Conference coming out. Yeah. You have, you know, my silent team, the Facebook group of, you know, 70 plus thousand members. Uh, you also have your course as well, which is a very good value, by the way, because there's hundreds of course material in there. And you guys are the only one with Amazon inside your name because mm -hmm. of all the value you've contributed for years and years and years. But why should people, you know, join the Proven Amazon Conference? What is it? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, the, the Proven Conference was birthed out of uh, this community that I was trying to build. We started it, you know, this is the 11th year that we've done it, which makes it, to my knowledge, it's certainly the longest running Amazon seller conference in the industry, but I think it may be one of the longest running e-commerce conferences. And 11 years is no joke in this industry to run the same conference. Uh, but it started off as just a group of us saying, hey, let's, you know, let's get together physically, you know, build those relationships like we were talking about before, how important those connections are. And we've just done it annually every year. And the thing I'm proud about this conference is uh, one of the things I'm most proud of is the fact that we don't bring in a whole bunch of outside speakers and YouTube gurus that you could go buy their books or listen to their podcasts. We don't bring those people in. No, we bring in our own students, our own coaches. We've got 60 coaches on our team. Like I said, we've coached 10,000 students over the years, some incredible success stories, some inc the most incredible, like homeless to homeowner type of just compelling, truly emotional stories. People that can just, you just want to cheer for them because of what they've been through. Let's put those people on stage. Let's be the people who have taken the proven Amazon course and started out knowing nothing. And now they're a leader in our community with incredible stories and tools and tips and strategies. That's what the Proven Amazon course is all about. It's our community getting together, almost like a big family reunion with arms wide open to anyone who's new, welcoming them in. And we we take a very abundance-minded type of approach to the new seller because we know that everyone who comes into our community new is a future potential source of inspiration, encouragement, opportunities, resources that we've never been exposed to before. Success is something that it, as many people can have as much of as they want. We don't have a closed-minded type of approach to success where we see it as a limited resource and only a few of us can have it. No, we see it as something as many people who want success can have it. Come on in. The more you succeed, the more likely we are to succeed. So that's kind of the, the heartbeat. It's theprovenconference.com is the website. If people want to come check it out, you guys are going to be there. It's just a true thrill for me that you guys are making the trip and coming all the way. You may get the longest travel award for this event. Thank you so much for making the trip and make it, being such generous sponsors this year as well. But there's going to be about 600 of us gathering in Columbus, Ohio, July 6th through 8th, 2023. Uh, everyone's welcome. It's a great honor. Uh, to be able to go and also share very specific, very actionable repricing tips from real people to real people. So it's proven. So the people who are going, you know, they actually have sales on Amazon. And like mm -hmm. you mentioned, there's different events throughout the year, but a lot of them are catered more for private label, for wholesale, sure. uh, retail. Mm -hmm. There's uh, different shows there. But this event is, you know, for arbitrage. It's a business model that could be easily replicated there's hundreds of success cases, if not thousands. And there's thousands of people who've already done the course. It's proven, period. And you know, by being there, you be in part of a community, you know, a tribe of people with a like-minded, and you could see other people who are successful. We could also see a lot of the top coaches to, who ha gives people a training as well. And Jim, you also have a coaching program as well. We have a lot of People who's watching this, you know, they might come to a plateau in their business. Uh, they've been at five figures. They've been at six figures for years and years and years. And they really need to get to that next level. What's the advantage of doing the coaching program with, that you guys got? Let me just brag on our coaching program for just a moment. There's a lot of coaching programs out there in e-commerce, but ours is the most established, meaning it's been around the longest. We're coming up on 20 years. Oh, wow. Over 19 years at this point, I've got a coaching program in e-commerce. See if you can find anybody who's been doing it half that long. It's going to be hard to find a thriving coaching program. We've got 60 coaches. And the thing that qualifies someone to become a coach on our team 
is they've got to have a wildly successful business of their own using the strategies we teach. You don't even get in the door for an interview if that's not the case. If you've got a wildly successful business using the strategies we teach in our community, the next step is, do you have a teacher's heart? Are you high in empathy? Do you like solving problems with other people? Do you have like a teacher's heart? Like, you know what a teacher's heart is? It just, they just resonate like, oh, I, I, I can't hear a problem without trying to fix it. They're the people always in the Facebook group, just answering questions when they can't sleep at 2 a.m., right? Those people. So you've got the combination of someone who's got a big heart, a teacher's heart, and then they've got a highly successful business. Well, that's who our coaches are. So just a relationship with someone like that is invaluable, let alone having them step you through the process of going from where you are now to where you know you could and should be with a coach. I mean, even the best performers in the world have coaches. Tiger Woods changed his entire golf game a handful of times throughout his career by getting a new coach to come in and help him perfect certain elements of his game, right? The best performing athletes and business owners in the world all have mentors and coaches that they rely on. It's one of the best investments you can ever make. So that's what our program is built around is, hey, let's spend some time with someone who can help you get further faster on this journey and make it a tremendous investment. And we're very proud of that program. We've got a handful of consultants that people can call anytime for free. And we'll talk about your business and give you some great ideas. And whether you work with us or not, you're going to leave better than you came. That's our guarantee. You're going to leave the call, leave that Zoom session better than when it started, no matter what your answer is. It's a very low pressure thing as well. But if you are positioned well, you have the margin in your life, the emotional, the financial, the time commitment, the relational margin. Like, does your spouse think you're crazy for being in e-commerce right now? That may not be the best arrangement. You know, you want to keep that relationship protected. Bring her around first, and then let's talk about coaching, right? So you got to have a margin in your life in all the right areas. If you're a good fit for coaching, yeah, let's go. We've got the people who are going to care and teach you and take you where you're trying to go. In some cases, you know, multiple seven-figure business owners, they're coaches, and they love working with new students and helping them succeed. So many great opportunities have risen out of that program over the years. I could talk for hours about it. I won't, but yeah, co who's coaching for us for someone who wants to go further faster and they've got the margin in their life, financial, emotional, relational, they've got to have your right, you know, health has got to be in, if you're sick and, and the doctor said, Hey, you need three months of bed rest. You shouldn't be doing anything. Well, that's not the time to start a business, right? So you got to have the right margin, but if you're positioned for it, yeah, let's go. So I think if you're watching this as our audience, you really want to get to the next level. And one of the things that Jim has shared with me is also the motivation. Like you are motivated. So you're, you of can course. put in you know, a minimum of 15 hours a week in this business, then you're a good candidate to do the coaching. And then yeah. it might grow over time because you're training the reps, you know, you're learning the game. And like Jim said, even the top athletes, for example, LeBron James, he has $1.5 million US he spent on coaching, on I hadn't his heard training. That. It doesn't surprise yeah. me. Yeah. It doesn't surprise like the best athletes in the world do that as well. We are always getting better at our craft. So it's really important to find people who's already done it. I want to go back to you, Jim. What are the benefits of joining the Proven Conference uh, for different level sellers? Yeah, it's we pride ourselves at this particular event, the Proven Amazon course. Now you can get the live stream for just a few dollars. That's one of the options that's available that gets you all the recordings as well. But to attend live, it's everything from brand new people to e-commerce who are, aren't even sure if this is for them or not. And they just want to kind of come experience it and start to dip their toe in the water. We're very newbie friendly, all the way up to very high-end, advanced, seven-figure sellers sharing tips and strategies and techniques for launching private label products and high-level consulting and the agency model. So it's kind of everything in between. Knowing that you know today's newbies are going to be tomorrow's fun success stories on the podcast. And then, you know, short time later, they're coaches and leaders in our community creating content. And then they're on stage at our events, right? So there's this life cycle that we've seen play out. Again, we've been doing this quite a while. And those are the stages we like to see people move through. So we're always open and welcome to new folks to come to the Proven Conference. We see so often that people move. I say it's a way to move your business forward six to nine months in three days. Oh, wow. Imagine moving your business six to nine months. That's that's incredible. Move it. Because you know your business moves forward when you fix what's broken, you improve on what's working, you scale, you build your relationships. We you know we've all heard it said that your future is 
if you want to know what your life's going to look like five years from now, show me the content you're consuming and the people you're hanging out with. Well, this is a way to consume the right content and hang out with the right people. It propels your business forward. You do that, you pack in those three days of intense relationships, you create a mastermind and people you're going to follow up with and ideas and strategies and new connections, new resources you didn't know existed. Suddenly your business, as you go home and implement those things in the next, in the following few weeks, you just made this massive leap into the future. You know, maybe you would have gotten there anyway, but it would have taken you a lot longer to get there. That's what a live event can do for your business. And that's why I'm going as well. So I'm going to go. I'm really happy, very honored to be going there. And we'll also be speaking about Be Cool a little bit. Now, I want to ask you, Jim, how has Be Cool helped your business? Oh, you know, you've got to use a repricer, especially with the models that we teach to any new seller, especially, you know, there now there's going to be a few sellers. They've been more advanced and moved on. Maybe they only have a handful of their own private label products or something. The repricer may not be needed there, but that's, that's later on in your career. If you're newer, if you're not selling a hundred thousand dollars a month yet, and you've got a big catalog of products, you need a repricer. And we've used a good handful of them in the past. I'm not going to throw anyone under the bus. You know, they did some good things, but when you guys came along, the thing that I really appreciate about what you guys do is you're very patiently, take your time, make sure that the user understands the different settings, the different options, the different scenarios, what we're trying to do. You guys have even built new features and functionality into your tool based on the user feedback from our community on the kind of things that we're looking for. And it's just the, uh, the reputation that you guys have as, you know, congratulations, 10 years, man, that's awesome. You know, 12 years, but we're calling it 10 because of COVID. I get it, man. But that's a long time, 10, 12 years in e-commerce. You're an OG, man. You guys have been doing this a while, doing it the right way, staying ahead of the technology curve. When Amazon says, hey, there's some changes coming, you guys pay attention. You fix things ahead of time. So I don't have to worry about those things. The tool works. It's priced right. I mean, 25 bucks to get in the door. Come on, man. And every time someone turns it on, they're like, holy cow, look at this, man. Why didn't I start using a repricer six months ago? Uh, so we love it. We talk about it all the time. And yeah, that, this is the repricer that we use. My mom, who's in her mid seventies now, runs the majority of my Amazon account along with her sister-in-law, my aunt. The two of them, they're the brains behind my Amazon operation and they love Be Cool. They love you guys. They use it all day, every day. And uh, we're super proud to be partnered up with you guys. Now, last question here. What do you usually do in your free time, if you have any? Oh, I have plenty. You know, I, <laughs> I consider... I, you know, I love living life in such a way where I don't know at any given time if I'm being a spiritual leader, if I'm being a husband, if I'm being a dad, if I'm being a business owner, if I'm enjoying my free time. It all kind of blends together. That's the reality of my life. I'm doing all of it all the time. And so, yeah, some of the hobbies I have, I love running, love basketball. I played today. My legs are sore as I'm sitting here. I played a lot of basketball in Indiana, man. You play basketball till you drop. That's just kind of how it is, man. Uh, so those are some of the activities I love. I love to read, just devour, ideally a handful of books per week. But we're you know, very blessed. I'm moving into a season where our kid, my kids are growing and getting married. I don't have that intense schedule of trying to drive them all over town, which I loved those years. But you know, the kids are becoming more independent. Three of them married now the house, just two at home now, and they've got their own busy social lives. So my time is beginning to free up. My business is beginning to thrive in new ways that I never could have imagined and anticipated. So just, a, it, it's a blessed career trajectory. There's no job. I, I'll tell you this, Sam, you'll probably never heard me say this before. We've talked many times, but I had the thought 10 years ago, and I would say it again today. If someone were to slide me a piece of paper and say, write any number you want on this piece of paper, and that's your annual salary. But in order to get it for the next 20 years, you have to make a 20 year commitment and you have to be at the office by 7 a.m. every day or 8 a.m. every day. And you have to stay till 6 or 7 p.m. that night. And you got a half hour commute to get there home and back, maybe more. But you can make as much money as you want. There's no number that you could put on that piece of paper that interests me because I get to enjoy the things in life that are eternal that really matter. My relationship with my spouse. I mean, she's right in the other room. I work from home. My kids come and go throughout the day. They were raised under this roof. If the daddy's doors were open, which is 90% of the time, they would come on in and show me what they're working on and ask me a question. That's doing life under my own terms. There's no amount of money that can replace that. But to have a, an incredible business that's blessed and all these incredible relationships and get to enjoy that? Come on, man. Life doesn't get any better than that. So how do I spend my free time? Doing stuff I love, just like I spend when I'm working. I, I love my work. I love my play. I love my family hanging out, serving God. I get to volunteer for all kinds of great organizations that I can pour my time and my life into. I don't know anyone who I've ever met and I'm like, 
I'd be more blessed if I was that guy. I, I don't, I've never met that person. I feel very truly blessed beyond what I deserve. That's fantastic. Yeah. You know, living life on your own terms uh, and being able to have the flexibility being there for your family as well. So that's fantastic. And I just want to leave with this for everyone who's listening. One of the top salespeople that I know, she went to a sales conference and she didn't have the money. So she drove beat up car about 13, 14 hours to go to that conference and she didn't have money to pay for you know, the nice hotel. And then, so she found a motel, which is even worse than super eight. So it's really, right. it, it's, it's not wrong of super eight, but I'm just saying it is, it, sure. is, it was a very dirty place, just a room, yeah. very low price. And she brought her nice clothes. So mm -hmm. in the daytime, she goes to the sales conference. She looks, you know, very, very professional. And she did it, you know, she made a good impression on the people there. Uh, and she met some friends there. In the nighttime, she would go back into her uh, little uh, hotel. And, you know, a few years later, you know, she became one of the top salespeople in her industry. And mm. that could be you if you're watching this. Yeah. So, Absolutely. you know, make sure to invest your time in the things that matter. Be around the right people. Consume the right content. And follow Jim and join the Proven Conference. I'd love to to see a few folks show up because of what we presented today. Thank you, Jim, for your time. And then uh, we'll catch you later. Yeah, and thanks, yeah. thanks a lot. I know it's late there Thank and I uh, really appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. Always good to hear from you guys.